Welcome to the Sonosite Behind the Scan webinar on rotator cuff pathology. My name is Laura Jacob, and I will be helping to moderate today's webinar. With me is Chris Pennell, Digital Content Specialist, who is helping behind the scenes, and Daniel Shelton, Director of MSK Market Development, who will be assisting with the live demo portion of the webinar. Before we begin, please be advised all attendees are muted. You may type your questions into the Q&A box at, located at the bottom of your screen at any time, and we will conduct a Q&A session at the end of the presentation and live demo. This webinar will be recorded and archived on our Behind the Scan webinar website for future reference. I am delighted to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Ben Dubois. Dr. Dubois is an orthopedic surgeon and shoulder surgery specialist at Grossman, Grossmont Orthopedic Medical Group. Ben Dubois is a board certified and fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon who devotes 100% of his practice to the treatment of shoulder disorders. Dr. Dubois has expert training in shoulder surgery and has extensive experience in shoulder replacements, rotator cuff disorders, and arthroscopic shoulder surgery. He has trained in the state of art state-of-the-art techniques, including reverse ball and socket shoulder replacement, and performs in-office shoulder ultrasound for the immediate diagnosis of rotator cuff disorders. Dr. Dubois has also contributed quite a bit of education for us here at Sonosite, including teaching at a cadaver lab and hosting a couple of webinars on diagnostic shoulder and shoulder injections, which can be found on Sonosite Institute. And today we're delighted to have him back for this webinar. And Dr. Dubois, I will turn it over to you to get started. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. It was very kind of you. Um, as she said, uh, my name is Benjamin Dubois. I'm an orthopedic shoulder surgeon in San Diego, California, and we're going to spend some time this evening talking about uh, rotator cuff pathology and ultrasonography of the supraspinatus tendon, which is one of the main things we look at as orthopedic surgeons. So I'm in San Diego in a private practice, been here since 2004 done several thousand shoulder surgeries throughout my career, so I'm pretty um, uh, pretty good as far as correlating ultrasound pathology to what I find during surgery. About half the surgeries I've done are shoulder replacement surgeries, and the other half are arthroscopic surgeries, such as a rotator cuff repair. And so my winding journey, how to, how to learn how to do MSK ultrasound, started back when I was doing my shoulder surgery fellowship with Dr. Rick Madsen at the University of Washington in 2003 and 2004. And at that time, there really wasn't any um, regimented program to teach young orthopedic surgeons like myself at the time how to do ultrasound. And so one day at the beginning of my fellowship, um, there appeared a laptop looking device. And I go, that looks interesting. What is that? And Dr. Madsen says, well, that is an ultrasound machine. It's at the very beginning of the advent of the portable handheld ultrasound machines that could be used by surgeons in our office. And so he gave me the choice. Do you want to spend a year in the in the rat lab doing research or would you rather learn how to do uh, ultrasound and hopefully do some research with that? So it was a very easy uh, choice for me. So I spent the year kind of teaching myself how to do it, use it in my own fellows clinic and I got a lot of really good feedback from the patients. And then when I got into practice in 2004, first thing I did is I bought myself an ultrasound machine and I've been doing it ever since. And so I've taught numerous MSK courses over the years, dating back to probably about 2006 or 2007, probably taught maybe over a thousand doctors and physicians assistants uh, how to use MSK in your practice. And so I use it predominantly in my practice. I'd say most of it is for ultrasound guided injections. Um, but also use it a lot for diagnostic studies, and that's what we're talking about this evening. So some of the things when you're starting out as a beginner, just like I was back in the day, technique is important. So you definitely want to learn how to use ultrasound properly from the beginning. So I would highly recommend getting hooked up with Fujifilm Sonosite to, to get some hands-on training or seek out um, a course of your own that you'd like to go. Uh, but the key is getting hands-on and learning how to do it right from the beginning. Repetition is important. There's certainly a learning curve in this. And so you want to get your hands on experiences as much as you can. Um, even if you don't really feel like you know exactly what you're doing right out of the gate, um, the more and more you do, you're going to get more and more comfortable simply holding the probe, knowing how to do an exam, and then also knowing what, how to interpret what you're actually seeing on the screen because there's there's really two main things. It's doing the exam properly, of course, so you can see the images of what you want to see. But it's also interpreting what you're seeing on the screen and understanding the difference between a normal exam and exam of pathology. 
it does get easier i promise you that um, a lot of people probably find it takes a couple of hundred uh, either ultrasound guided injections or diagnostic studies to really feel like you know what you're doing um, but certainly it's operator dependent you are the operator it's just like being a surgeon um, you know you are the you're the operator the probe is in your hands but like I tell most people who come to my courses that I teach, I said, look, you got up out of bed this morning, you got in your car, you drove to work. All those things are operator dependent. I have no doubt you can handle this or you can handle that. So it just takes some time. So why do we want to use MSK ultrasound in our offices? Well, you can image all the things that are of interest to you um, as an MSK specialist, muscle, tendon, fluid, bone. These are the things that we like to look at as orthopedic surgeons. Uh, ultrasound provides you with dynamic live images. So it's different than just a simple static x-ray or a static image from a CT scan or a static image from an MRI. You, this is all live. It allows you to move the probe anywhere you want, take as many angles as you want at something, or you can look at it from multiple different views. Uh, so that's one of the nice things. There's no known side effects, so there's no radiation. So for example, if you try to do live images with a CT scan, that's a lot of radiation where ultrasound has none of that. So there's no known side effects. Uh, these machines are portable, either handheld, you can carry them around, or you can get one and put it on the rolling cart, which is very handy. And they're relatively inexpensive. Certainly when you compare this to uh, the cost of an MRI machine, it's, it's significantly less expensive and it's more affordable for uh, people who are in maybe private practice or small group practices, um, there's very high spatial resolution. So you'd be amazed when you get your hand on one of the newer models, just how clearly you can see things down to a millimeter. It's pretty remarkable. When I was starting back in 2004, I, I would equate it to the comparison of watching a black and white television versus what we have currently with a 4K ultra high definition. So things have come along a long, long way because of companies like Fujifilm Sonosite. I mean, they've, they've spent a lot of time and resources improving the image quality that we have today. And one of the important things about ultrasound and, and one of the main uses I get out of it in my private practice is using it on post rotator cuff repair patients because there's no artifact like you would get on an MRI. And so I don't know how many of you have seen MRIs that have had prior surgery before, but there's a lot of artifact it kind of looks very blurry it looks like kind of a bomb went off in that shoulder and you really can't see what you would like to see because of the artifact of say sutured anchors or metal implants or things like that so when you're first starting out um, one of the nice things about ultrasound uh, when you're learning in my mind i try to compare the images that i'm getting with a shoulder ultrasound to what I would see on something I was very familiar with looking at, which is an MRI. And so the MRI, you're either going to have a coronal cuts, sagittal cuts, or axial cuts. And so on ultrasound, you are getting those same so-called cuts. It's just you have to perform the ultrasound to put the probe in the appropriate position so you get the images that you would like. And so here's a side-by-side -side comparison of what a coronal view of a supraspinatus tendon looks like. And so on the right side, is an MRI, which is a coronal view of the right shoulder. And so you see the entire ball and socket. You see all the way deep down into the agazola. So it's kind of a big picture. You can see the supraspinatus certainly draped over the top of the humeral head and inserting, but that area is relatively small compared to the overall picture of the MRI image. Whereas on the left, you have a coronal image of a supraspinatus insertion. And so what you see is right above the dense uh, transverse white line, which is the cortex of the humeral head, you'll see the supraspinatus tendon in really good detail with a very small dark line surrounding that, which is the subacromial space. And so there's a little bit of fluid in the subacromial space under normal circumstances. But what you can see with this is you're really getting a very zoomed in image of the supraspinatus compared to an MRI. There's an important concept that you need to understand as you're beginning to do ultrasound and as you're moving forward with your skill set, because you can get caught up very easily thinking that there is a tear there when in reality there is not. And this is something called anisotropy. And anisotropy is in essence something that you can equate to a false positive on an ultrasound machine image. Meaning you think you're seeing a tear of a tendon, for example, but in reality, there's no tear there. 
And typically what this has to do with is the ultrasound probe not being perpendicular to the fibers that you're looking at. So for example, on the left side here, we're seeing a coronal image or as if you're looking at someone's shoulder from the front of the left shoulder and the dense white line at the bottom of the screen that's the top of the humeral head right above it is a supraspinatus insertion and what you notice is is there is for the most part um, uh, generally speaking the, the signal is um, the same there's not a lot of heterogeneous signal there's not a lot of dark areas in it you can really see the tendon quite clearly as it's attaching to bone whereas on the right this is the exact same shoulder but what I've done is I've just tilted my probe about 10 to 20 degrees. And if you notice to the right of the screen, that area of darkness, which looks like it's enveloping probably 90% of the lateral supraspinatus. Most people who would look at that who are beginners would say, hey, that's a, that's a tear. That's a high grade partial thickness undersurface tear. But in reality, it's not. And so once you get the ultrasound probe in your hand, you're gonna be able to tell what anisotropy is because all it really is is angling your probe 10 to 20 degrees. It's not very much, and you can literally make tendons disappear. Um, and so that's a very important concept to understand when you're starting. And this is one of the reasons why with the supraspinatus tendon, we see anisotropy and it's, you see the area which is labeled B. Those are more of the superficial dorsal sided fibers inserting into the lateral uh, anatomic footprint of the humeral head. And if you notice, those fibers are going relatively transverse at a very shallow angle as they insert. And so the ultrasound probe would be overlying that, would send the, uh, the transducer waves into that, and they would bounce directly back into the probe and be captured by the probe. And the probe and the computer would interpret those as a solid tendon. Whereas if you see the area labeled A, if you notice those fibers of the supraspinatus are taking a right turn and they're kind of diving down perpendicular to that medial aspect of the anatomic footprint. And the reason that area disappears with anisotropy is because those ultrasound waves are bouncing off of that A area at an angle and they're reflecting away from the probes. The probe is not capturing all of the waves that it's sending down there. They're not all coming back to the probe and how the computer on the inside of the machine interprets that is there's nothing there. And so that's why it ends up being dark. So when you're getting patients ready to be examined, I think it's important that you have both shoulders exposed just in case you would like to look at the contralateral shoulder as a comparison view. What we always wanna do is set things up so we can get coronal views and sagittal views. And so with a coronal view, Typically, I would have the patient put their hand in their hip and bring their elbow back because what they're trying to do is deliver the insertion of the supraspinatus out from the undersurface of the acromion because ultrasound waves are not going to penetrate through the acromion because it's a thick bone. The ultrasound waves will just reflect off of it and you won't be able to see the tendon. So as you deliver that insertion out from underneath the humeral head, or I'm sorry, the acromion, what you do is you put your probe parallel to the fibers of the supraspinatus. And so those fibers of the supraspinatus are originating right up underneath the trapezius and they're inserting right there in the lateral anterior aspect of the humeral head. And so on the right side of the screen, what we see is a nice coronal view of the insertion of the supraspinatus. So there's no tear there. It's a normal appearing coronal view. Now, in order to get a sagittal view, all I do is turn my probe 90 degrees. It's as simple as that, 90 degrees. Now, it can be difficult because you've got a bunch of gel on there and things are a little slippery. So you've got to stabilize the probe on the shoulder as you're rotating at 90 degrees. And as you do that, you're going to get a sagittal view. And so now my probe has been turned so it's actually perpendicular to the line of the fibers of the supraspinatus. And so on the right side of the screen, what we see is on the very left side of that image, you see that uh, dense hyperechoic oval that's the biceps tendon and the biceps tendon runs in the rotator cuff interval which is just in between the anterior supraspinatus and the upper border of the subscapularis and so that's kind of a landmark we look for in shoulder ultrasound is looking for that biceps tendon because then you can tell exactly where you are you know you're in the rotator cuff interval just to the right of that is the anterior aspect of the supraspinatus so once again we've got a nice thick healthy tendon here no tears now this is what a full thickness tear looks like. I know many of you are just starting out, but if you go to your office tomorrow and put the ultrasound probe on someone's shoulder, 
you shouldn't miss this because sometimes it's really this obvious. So on the left side of the screen, what we've got is a coronal image of a left shoulder. And so the right side of the screen there of the image is lateral. The left side of the screen is medial. And so what we see is that very clear bird's beak appearance of the supraspinatus as it starts out quite thick on the left side of the screen and it tapers off into the bird's beak on the right side of the screen. And so that is a normal looking supraspinatus. The bottom white line, that hyperacolic line, is the cortex of the humeral head. The second hyperacolic white line above the supraspinatus is the interval between the superior supraspinatus and the fascia of the undersurface of the deltoid. And so normally you would see a double white line like that. Now on the right side of the screen, right smack dab in the middle of the image, you see a bunch of darkness, okay? And darkness on ultrasound typically equates to fluid. And so the dummy's approach to ultrasound is if you see a bunch of fluid where there should be a rotator cuff, that's a full thickness tear typically. And so what we see is fluid where fluid doesn't belong. And the other thing you see is the deltoid, which are those transverse fibers running right above that hypoechoic dark area. The deltoid is almost touching the top of the humeral head. It shouldn't be doing that because there should be a big, thick supraspinatus tendon there like there is on the left side of the screen. So this is a coronal image of a full thickness tear of a supraspinatus with about two centimeters of retraction at least. There's a little stump to the left side of the screen, that hyperechoic area, that's probably the retracted edge of the tendon. Now, if I turn my probe 90 degrees, same shoulder, on the left side of the screen, I've got a perfectly normal appearing sagittal image. So there's that hyperechoic oval on the right side, that's the biceps tendon. Just to the left of that is a nice, thick, healthy looking supraspinatus tendon, anterior, middle, and posterior. So there's no areas of fluid there. You look at the right side of the screen and what you've got is the same thing as the previous images. You've got fluid where fluid doesn't belong. You've got fluid going from the top of the humeral head all the way to the undersurface of the deltoid. That is a full thickness tear. To the left side of that image, you'll notice there's some tendinous stuff uh, in between the humeral head and the undersurface of the deltoid. So that's probably getting into some posterior supraspinatus or maybe upper part of infraspinatus that's still intact. Now, as a surgeon, I scope a lot of these shoulders. And so I have the benefit of being able to see what it looks like on ultrasound or MRI and comparing that to what I actually find during surgery. And so this is the same patient. This is a torn, full thickness supraspinatus tendon that's retracted over to almost the level of the articular margin. So this is about a two centimeter retracted tear. So on the left side there, you see at the bottom of the screen, um, the anatomic footprint from where the tendon has tore away from. Now I've already prepped out this area with, with my, uh, my burr to kind of get it ready to repair. So it's a nice smooth surface, bleeding surface. Uh, that's good for something to heal to. And then at the top of the screen, you see that dense or thick white uh, tendon that's retracted. That's the supraspinatus tendon. So my job is to take that tendon and repair it down to that anatomic footprint from where it tore away from. And so how we typically do that is with suture anchors. And so on the right side of the image, this is after the repair. So you'll see there's three small holes that I tapped in the tuberosity area, pass the sutures through the tendon, pull the tendon back over, and then I anchored it down with things called suture anchors, which can either be titanium or bioabsorbable plastic. Um, and so it doesn't really matter what, what they're made of, but the, the concept is to tack that thing back down to the bone. And these typically take about 10 to 12 weeks to be completely healed after repair. So that is a solid looking rotator cuff repair with three sutures and three anchors. This is also a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So on the left, you have a coronal image and on the right, you have a sagittal image. And what we see once again is uh, the dark fluid that goes all the way from the surface of the top of the humeral head all the way up to the undersurface of the deltoid. And on the left side of the left image there, you'll see a stump of the supraspinatus tendon overlying the humeral head. And that, that stump is a retracted tear. Also what you notice on the right there just appears to be a lot of debris and a lot of kind of shredded up stuff 
in that area, which oftentimes we'll find arthroscopically to be a lot of shredded up bursal tissue. Sometimes it's torn up tendon. Uh, I could just tell before I scoped the shoulder that I was going to find some kind of ratty looking tissue in there. And so that's exactly what I found. And so on the left side of the screen, this is what the full thickness tear looks like. This is more of a degenerated, kind of kind of shredded up, ratty looking tear where you still have some remnants of the tendon attached to the tuberosity at the bottom of the screen that I would subsequently remove before I did my repair. At the top of the screen on the left, you have this kind of shredded up supraspinatus tendon that's retracted about a centimeter and a half or so. And then that, that kind of uh, bright white thing right from the middle of the screen, that's the long head of the biceps as it's running out of the shoulder joint down the bicipital groove. And so my job here, once again, is to kind of remove all the shredded up stuff, prep this thing, pass a couple of sutures through the tendon, tap two holes down there in the anatomic footprint, and dunk my anchors into there and tighten it down. And so that's another good looking repair. This is a very interesting case, um, and we'll see these periodically, which is a delaminated full thickness tear. And so in the middle of the screen here, what we've got is it is a coronal image. So as if you're looking at a shoulder from the front uh, of the right shoulder. So to the left of the screen would be lateral deltoid. To the, to the right of the screen is medial going more towards the patient's head. And what I see here in the middle of the screen is I see almost two layers of a tendon. It looks like a, like a V turned on its side, where in the subacromial space, I'll see what appears to be a delaminated, differentially retracted uh, uh, tendon right about, right about here at the top. Whereas underneath what I see is what appears to be still intact tendon on the articular side. So this to me looks like it could be a partial tear. It could be a delaminated full tear. But what tipped me off that this is probably a full thickness tear is I see once again, darkness here, fluid where fluid doesn't belong. Fluid like this is a lot. And this should be retained within a joint space. But what I see is that dark area outside the rotator cuff. That indicates to me there's probably a full thickness perforation of the tendon and it's accumulating outside of the rotator cuff. And so when I scoped the shoulder, I found exactly what I thought I would find and what, what remarkably looked just like the ultrasound image. So on the left side of the screen, kind of tells the whole story. At the top of the screen, I've got that differentially retracted, bursal sided uh, tear. But if you notice underneath that, just, just to the bottom of the screen, we've got that intact band of supraspinatus that's still attached to the greater tuberosity. But as we filled the shoulder up with sterile fluid during arthroscopy, all of a sudden a hole appeared. That's where the fluid's coming from. That's the bottom right side of the screen. That's the full thickness perforation through the tendon. So that's where all that fluid is kind of extravasating out of and accumulating the subacromial space. And so what I'll do is I'll debride all this stuff up and I'll end up repairing it. So if you're a beginner with ultrasound, here is a good thing to start with. Somebody who comes into the office, typically they're elderly, they can barely raise their arm away from their body. You get an x-ray and it shows evidence of something called rotator cuff arthropathy. And rotator cuff arthropathy is the end result of a massive, chronic, retracted, atrophic rotator cuff tear that typically involves the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and oftentimes the subscapularis. And so what you'll find on x-ray is these telltale signs that they've got chronic massive tears. You notice the humeral head is articulating with the undersurface of the acromion. So there's no space in between those, those two bones for a rotator cuff to be existing. And so automatically, you know that this is gonna be a big old tear. And so to develop your confidence with ultrasound, why don't you ultrasound one of these? Because you're a hundred percent sure before you ever put the ultrasound probe on somebody's shoulder, that you're not even gonna be able to see a rotator cuff because it's all torn and retracted. And so typically what you're gonna see is on the right side of the screen, uh, the, the dense white line is the uh, cortex of the superior humeral head. And just above it, you've got that little dark area of fluid, which is fluid emanating from the joint. And just on top of that is the deltoid. And what you'll see in these cases is deltoid is draped right over the top of the humeral head. There's no rotator cuff in sight. Okay. And so these are pretty easy cases to start out with.
This is what it looks like arthroscopically as I'm in the joint looking up at the undersurface of that supraspinatus. So that area that looks like a little rolled border going from top to bottom, that is the edge of the retracted atrophic supraspinatus tear. And that shredded up thing right there, kind of the bottom of the screen, that's actually where the long head of the biceps is attaching to the superior glenoid. So you can see this tendon is retracted all the way to the level of the glenoid, which was not a surprise based on these x-rays and ultrasounds. One of the most satisfying things in my practice is dealing with something called calcific tendonitis. And so calcific tendonitis can be a very debilitating, painful disorder that people get for really unknown reasons. And so they come to the office, they're hurting like heck, you get an x-ray, you see this big wad of calcium overlying the anatomic footprint and the greater tuberosity. And so most of these cases, the calcium is residing within the substance of the supraspinatus. Sometimes it's escaped out of it into the subacromial space, but oftentimes you'll see this residing within the tendon. And so if I'm ultrasounding this same patient, what we'll see here right smack dab in the middle of the screen is the supraspinatus as it's attaching to the greater tuberosity will have this dark hypoechoic circular area within the substance of the tendon. That is a calcium. Oftentimes this calcium is so dense, ultrasound waves are not penetrating through it. They're all reflecting off of the superior aspect of the wad of calcium and they're reflecting back into the probe. And so the probe interprets that as a hypoechoic area with nothing residing in there. Now we know there is something residing in there. It's just, it's just such dense calcium, the ultrasound waves are not penetrating it. And what you notice is on the undersurface of where the calcium is, there's something that I refer to as a bone shadow. And so the ultrasound will not penetrate through the calcium. And so what you'll get is almost a shadowing where the cortex of the superior humeral head disappears underneath it. So it's not a fracture, but the, the cortex is there. You're just not seeing it because the ultrasound waves are not penetrating. Now, these are super fun cases because they're very satisfying. On the left side of the screen, I have an image of what one of these red hot, painful calcific tendonitis, tendonitis cases looks like. So I'm in the subacromial space. I kind of got a bird's eye view. That's my shaver. The metallic thing on the left is my shaver. And right below that, you see that white area. It looks like a zit ready to be popped or a volcano about to erupt. And surrounding it is just this very intense, inflamed, dorsal uh, action going on. Uh, this is why people hurt. And so as soon as you take a needle and you poke a little hole in that tendon, it's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. This calcium just comes flying out of it, explodes out of it like a volcano erupting. So these are super satisfying cases because you can solve people's problems essentially immediately, get rid of it, wash all that stuff out of there and you're done. Bursitis cases, you know, normally we don't see a lot of rip roaring bursitis cases, but periodically we will. Uh, we'll see patients with something that looks like this. And so this is a coronal image of the left shoulder. And so mm -hmm. to the medial aspect of the screen, we've got the, the, the uh, medial uh, aspect of the supraspinatus. To the right, we've got the insertion of the supraspinatus uh, over the anatomic footprint. And the area directly surrounding that, you see a dark band of fluid in between the cortex of the humeral head and the undersurface of the deltoid. So that's a lot of fluid in there. And so these are super duper easy to get at with ultrasound guided injections because your target is such a large area of fluid. It's like throwing a rock into the ocean. You can't miss, particularly using ultrasound. You can watch the needle go right into that fluid. And as you're injecting some anti-inflammatory cortisone in there, you can see that fluid actually filling up that space. So that's what the bursitis looks like. One of the main benefits I get out of my practice being a shoulder surgeon and doing lots and lots of arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs is if somebody down the road ever was not doing well after their rotator cuff repair, or sometimes people take their slings off four weeks after surgery and take the dog for a walk and trip over the curve and hurt the shoulder. Those people are really concerned that they maybe disrupted the repair that I just performed. And so ultrasound is really, really good for looking at these because an MRI is going to probably be just about worthless because of all the artifact because of the suture and the suture anchors. But with ultrasound, you don't get any artifact. You simply can actually see the sutures. So on the left and the right, you're going to notice right in the middle of the screen there, 
over the top of the humeral head within the substance of the supraspinatus itself, you're going to see a dense white line. That is one of the arthroscopic sutures, which are typically non-absorbable, thick nylon-based type of sutures that, that stay in there forever. And so you'll be able to see on the ultrasound whether that tendon is torn or not. And so both of these on both the left and the right images, I would feel super happy about um, the results of this if someone came to the office not doing well, because I would see this and I'd say, listen, I see bone, I see tendon, I see suture within the substance of the tendon. I don't see a bunch of fluid where tendon belongs. And so this looks like an intact rotator cuff to me. And so I would be very pleased with the result of this ultrasound. I'd be able to tell the patient that we're doing just fine. So we have reached the end of my portion here. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Daniel, who's going to be doing a live supraspinatus ultrasonography from the studio. And then we're going to follow that up with question and answers live. And so I will be available uh, to answer any questions people may have about the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dubois. Um, if you have not visited the Sonosite Learning Institute, I really encourage you to go check those videos out that we have previously done covering a comprehensive rotator cuff. Tonight, we're not going over all of the rotator cuff structures. We will be covering uh, the supraspinatus primarily, as was the topic of interest tonight, but we have done comprehensive live recorded webinars uh, to show all the structures uh, ranging from the biceps all the way around to the teres minor and some other oddball structures that were brought up in the Q&A. So um, just know that this is a session um, with you and Dr. Dubois. I'm simply going to be running the hands and I'll do a quick um, overview of the, of the supraspinatus and its landmarks um, here in the studio. But at any point in time, if you want to ask Dr. Dubois a question um, while we're scanning even, that's fine. Um, just feel free to interrupt. You can type your questions right there in the chat portal. And uh, Laura or Chris will be manning the, the chat portal. So with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with the, uh, the live demonstration. Today, we've got the Sonosite PX here on the stand. And um, I'm going to be using the larger footprint linear. This is the L15 transducer. So it's 15 megahertz. And I'm just going to start by patient positioning. Uh, this is a really big deal when it comes to the supraspinatus and that we have to deliver this um, supraspinatus out from underneath the acromion, just like Dr. Dubois uh, spoke about. I'm going to move our chair over just a little bit. There we go. Seems like something had moved before we got started. Um, here we go. Okay. So if you're in the anatomical position, arm just out to the side, palm facing forward, the greater tuberosity is tucked under the acromion. I'll demonstrate that real quick. Screen left will be lateral. And here we can see, um, let's see how that's looking on zoom. Here we can see the bony acoustic landmark of the acromion process. I'm going to turn my gain up just a touch for zoom. There we go. And then here we can see the body of the supraspinatus and the greater tuberosity out underneath. So we're looking for bony landmarks first. So greater tuberosity, humeral head is underneath this shadow. So to deliver the rest of this tendon out from under this acromion, what I need to do, it would be great if I could abduct more and pull it out, but we just, we run out of leverage, right? So what we have to do is we have to have our patient lean a little forward and bring the elbow back and the hand resting on the back hip. What that does is it rolls, it internally rotates the supraspinatus and the greater tuberosity to an anterior structure. You can see where my gel was. Now we're about to roll it anteriorly. So if I did put my probe right back where it was, this cuff structure down here is infraspinatus and transverse. I have to roll my probe all the way anterior this far just to start to make out the greater tuberosity and profile. There we go. So again, following our, our cortical landmark, humeral head, greater tuberosity. The further posterior we go, which we covered on the comprehensive rotator cuff, if I go more posterior, the greater tuberosity flattens out and we get the fibers of the infraspinatus. So you don't want to go too far posterior. You want to go anterior enough that we leave the humeral head 
um, in its, in its kind of cartilaginous look and the supraspinatus on top. And let's go find the biceps tendon anteriorly here. So this is the biceps leaving the joint going in towards the bicipital groove. And that means we've gone anterior enough. So my next lateral structure is supraspinatus. So this is greater tuberosity here, long axis supraspinatus, overlying deltoid up here, these, these long axis fibers. And then right here is that subdeltoid fascia that Dr. Dubois had mentioned. So after I assess this for volume and anisotropic artifact, which let's show that real quick. So all I have to do to maintain perpendicularity to these tendons is, is drop the handle of the probe almost to the floor. Now watch what happens when I bring the handle up, basically causing the fibers that are insertional where my arrow is to dive away from the transducer. We get these anechoic fibers or these zero or lack of echo fibers. And that's what anisotropy uh, artifact looks like. That, that's a really good, that's a great image, Dan, to, to show everybody because that is the number one thing that I see people getting tripped up on these so-called false positive exams where you're pretty convinced that there's a tear there and it's always that exact same spot too it's that it's that uh, articular sided uh, fibers of the supraspinatus where they take that little right turn and, and nose dive into the bone um, so that's good to show and the other thing folks is um, the probe that dan's using that is the workhorse probe typically for someone who's doing a bunch of msk ultrasound i use that probe for probably 80% of what I do. I use the curvilinear probe, which he's got also there. I think he's got a deeper probe, which is a lower lower um, frequency probe. That, that goes deeper into the body, but the detail that you see with the probe is not quite as good. So you would use that, for example, to inject uh, a hip joint, or I will use that oftentimes to inject a glenohumeral joint, which is a little bit of a deeper structure. Great point, uh, Dr. Dubois. So I'm gonna move to the um, sagittal equivalent. So I'm in the coronal equivalent. Now what I'm gonna do is just turn the probe 90 degrees. I'm gonna keep um, screen, um, let's keep screen left to the patient's posterior. I'm just gonna rotate the transducer. I'm not even looking at the screen. I wanna make sure I was relatively 90 degrees to where I started. Now you'll notice that the inside of the probe is tucked almost towards where the chest is. That's how far medial you need to go to see the biceps. So we need to see that bony landmark of the humeral head, and we're going to follow it anteriorly and inferiorly here to the biceps. So here's the biceps tendon and it's short axis. It is still intraarticular at this point, and it's surrounded by a few ligaments not, not spoke about today, but we did go over in a previous um, live demonstration. So we're going to get out of the interval, and go to the anterior margin of the supraspinatus, which is this guy right here. So we can see the anterior margin. Here's the middle and the posterior supraspinatus. And then the rest of this back here is infraspinatus. And then we have the nice uh, smooth cortex of the humeral head. Articular hyaline cartilage is nice and dark. And then up superficial to all of this cuff structure, we have the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And at least its interface. On a normal patient, it can be a little difficult to see, but sometimes you'll still catch a nice dark uh, line. If you have a have trouble seeing it, you can just slightly wag the elbow and you can get the rotator cuff to slide underneath that fascial interface independent of, uh, of the cuff. So there we have the cuff gliding under the fascial interface and we see a nice volume here. So Dr. Dubois, when you're in short axis, is that your, yeah. is, that, is that your summarizing view because you can see the whole yeah. volume? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, yeah. that's a great view. So, so People need to understand that when, when we're looking for rotator cuff tears of the supraspinatus, typically where those tears begin is the far anterior supraspinatus. So right where that yellow arrow is um, on the supraspinatus, which is just posterior to the long head of the biceps, that's where most tears occur. And as the tear becomes larger and larger, it'll start to extend more posteriorly. So oftentimes on ultrasound, you'll see fluid right there next to the biceps where there should be tendon directly above where that yellow arrow is, but then posteriorly getting into the posterior supraspinatus and into the infraspinatus, that'll be intact. And so you will see what looks like pretty normal tendon posteriorly, but then anteriorly there'll be 
usually what you'll see is the deltoid itself kind of drooping into the into the gap where the bite where the um, rotator cuff used to be so you'll see it kind of drooping down in there um, one key point here is as you're learning how to do all these things you're going to get lost early and often we all do we all did and so if you get lost and you don't really know what you're looking at anymore, you don't know, hey, am I looking at the supraspinatus, the subscapularis, what the heck am I looking at? Go find the biceps tendon, okay? Because the biceps tendon uniformly runs in the rotator cuff interval, which is gonna go right in between the supraspinatus and the subscap. And then, then you can reorient yourself where you are. So if you see that view that Daniel's showing you, you know just to the left of the biceps tendon is the supraspinatus. Very nice. Do we have any questions in the chat portal? No questions yet, Daniel. All right. So I'm going to take this scan a little further from the humeral head out to the thesis of the greater tuberosity. So here we see cartilage. We have we have nice cuff structure on top, and I can show that this is nice, healthy tendon. One tip is to just angle the probe and use anisotropy to your advantage. So a healthy tendon will turn dark. A uh, abnormal tendon will remain echogenic because it's backfilled with dense collagen, but it's non-linear, non-fibrillar, and it's not going to respond to angle artifact anymore. So we have a nice healthy rotator cuff here, and we're going to follow that out laterally. By laterally, I mean on the greater tuberosity. I'm going to drop my transducer, relatively speaking, towards the floor, and uh, we'll be scanning down the greater tuberosity until it looks like there's a little rooftop. So we still see biceps, screen right. This is our most um, anterior or superior facet of the greater tuberosity. So that's our enthesis of supraspinatus. This is our enthesis of infraspinatus. And here's that apex. So this is middle facet, anterior or super, uh, superior, uh, depending on the text reference there. But uh, here's the very most enthesis shot. And here's where you're going to see the cortex really change and get rough, wouldn't you say? Or if you're checking out your anchors, uh, Dr. Dubois, that's, this is a great spot to be looking for uh, loose nylon. That's right. And, and like Daniel alluded to, in people who have chronic rotator cuff tears, oftentimes instead of seeing that perfect dense cortex that we're seeing right here, uh, you'll see it looks like almost like something's been taking a bite out of it. It looks very rough, irregular, abnormal. That's just a chronic problem that develops over time in people who have longstanding rotator cuff tears. All right, so to summarize, we started in the long axis, which is, um, it's really the shot everybody likes to go straight to, uh, the, the easy shot. I've heard it described, especially at Dr. Dubois' courses uh, that they hold twice a year there in Vegas, is uh, to point the proximal side of the transducer just behind the ear in this diagonal angle. And now I'm just going to rotate the transducer and point the rest of the transducer down towards the umbilicus. So long axis is nice and pretty. It gives you that coronal um, equivalent, but the sagittal is your summarizing volume view. So if you catch this image here and all the volume is there, uh, it looks like a, and, you know, I've heard this described also as a, this is a wheel and this is a tire and we have a fully inflated tire. So when we have volume loss, we have deflation, that deltoid will dip down and fill the spot. But those are the two views uh, that everybody comes in and wants to see immediately if there's a cuff tear. Um, let's go ahead and have our patient relax. You can see a lot of that anatomy without stressing your patient. So you might just plop the probe down and see what you can see like we did in the beginning. We had the acromion in the, in the view. We're not in the anatomical position right now just because our patient's internally rotated and her arms just right on the lap. So I can see a lot of that volume without having to torture my patient uh, right away. So. If you don't suspect a, a tear at this point, this big gaping tear with cortical irregularities on the tuberosity, go ahead and try your short axis. See what you can see, but it's when you put that tendon under tension that, it, that it'll really show itself if it has a tear. Dr. Dubois, is there any dynamic maneuvers that you like to employ at this yeah. point? Yes, we do. So there's something called the dynamic contraction test. And so we do see in our office a subset of patients who have a non-displaced full thickness rotator cuff tear. These are usually relatively acute. 
Um, the tendon has been torn so recently, it hasn't really had an opportunity to begin to retract and become kind of withered away. And so on static images, it appears that the tendon is still attached to the bone because it's just kind of draped right over the top of the anatomic footprint. Only with something called a dynamic contraction test will you see some retraction of the tendon compared to the tuberosity. So you'll actually see it pulling away from the bone as you have the patient flex their deltoid against and their supraspinatus against your resistance. So Daniel's putting his hand on her elbow and she's doing an isometric contraction against his resistance. And just when you do this with a patient, you gotta tell them, be gentle, gently press your elbow against my hand. Because if you don't say that, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna yeah. fly, your arm's gonna fly up and it's gonna hit you in the face. And so it's a nice gentle thing. And so as the supraspinatus muscle belly is contracting, if that tendon is not torn like this one and it's perfectly adherent to the bone, that tendon's not going anywhere. You won't see any action really at all with that tendon, maybe a tiny millimeter of shift as the muscle contracts. But a person who has a non-displaced full thickness tear, you're going to see the edges of those tendons laterally pull medially and displace away from the bone, okay? And also sometimes what you'll see is some fluid extravasating out of the joint and coming out that hole and kind of accumulating outside the rotator cuff. So that's the dynamic contraction test. That's a really awesome dynamic maneuver. I will say I never saw that in all of my ultrasound training and MSK for all of these years until the workshops put on by you guys as, as orthopedic surgeons. So in, um, I will say in the orthopedic surgery world in particular, you guys are like the MacGyvers of figuring out your own maneuvers because you're doing a lot of these physical exams in a unique way aside from non-operative folks. So if, if, uh, if non-ops could deploy some of these techniques ahead of time, it, it does also add to the dynamic exam. Um, this forced abduction, I've, I had not seen that until I, I was at your workshop um, a long time ago there, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. DeWas. So, uh, it's just a unique perspective to see what somebody that needs this in clinic to, to make op, you know, um, operative decisions um, to prove to yourself as a surgeon that this needs to go to the OR, the other, the other dynamic maneuvers of necessity that you've come up with. So right. very, very right. cool. Very useful. If we still don't have any questions in the chat portal, I, I, uh, Really thank everybody for their time this evening. I know it's getting a little late and uh, look for the recording. If the, if you have anybody that did register for the meeting, they will get a copy of the recording. Uh, Laura, do you have anything or Chris in closing comments before we shut it down? We do not have anything in the Q and A, um, but I do want to second the thank you to you and Dr. Dubois for joining us today. This was really, really interesting webinar. Um, and again, uh, just want to mention those other webinars on Somerset Institute. Uh, they're viewable at any time. We will post this recording as well. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Have a Thanks great everybody. night.